You ever wonder about how things might be different now? Had things in the past gone differently? That's right, a good old game of what if. What if you had tried out for the basketball team in high school? What if you had chosen a different career path? What if you had just swallowed your pride and paid the extra couple bucks to have guacamole on your burrito? And then what about the stuff that affects everyone? Like, what if the inventor of the internet, Tim Berners-Lee, had decided his life's passion was being a dog walker and Instead. Hey, I wouldn't blame him. Well, how about if Sega had partnered with Sony and completely altered the history of video games? Something that nearly did happen, and in a lot of ways, probably should have happened. When it comes to failed Sony partnerships, the one that everybody likes to remember is the failed partnership with Nintendo. Understandably so, seeing as Nintendo made a public showing of announcing that they were partnering with a company that Sony was expecting to be them, a fair assumption, considering they had been in the process of developing a CD add-on for them. So when Nintendo said Philips instead, Sony thought, hey, that's not us, Nintendo, you dinglehoppers or, you know, something like that. Now, when it comes to the next part of the story, a lot of people have a misconception that in a fit of rage, everyone at Sony was immediately determined to release their own console by themselves. Rocky theme song at full volume in the background. But this was 1991. The PlayStation wouldn't be released for another few years. In the meantime, Sony was actually still considering working with Nintendo for roughly roughly a year afterwards, that is, if they even still wanted to make a console at all. You gotta remember, video games weren't as proven of a market at the time as they are now. Sony had their concerns, and if they were going to get into it, they wanted to do it with a proven commodity like Nintendo, despite being burned and burned hard. Sony had a saying back then, fool me once, darn, fool me twice, please don't. Okay, yeah, add that to the list of details I've probably embellished. But as Sega gained a lot of traction, they managed to get Sony's attention, thanks in large part to Mr. Tom Kalinske, aka Sega's savior as far as I'm concerned. Tom Kalinske, who was Sega of America's president and CEO at the time, I'll refer to him as just Tom from now on. So part of Tom's strategy with Sega was to approach anybody who had issues with Nintendo and say, how would you like to take a walk on the wild side with Sega? Which, lucky for him, Nintendo had roughly a lot of feathers, publishers who were pissed off by Nintendo's game restrictions, distributors who were pissed off with Nintendo's supply chain, parents who were pissed off with Nintendo for not making the Super Nintendo backwards compatible, the six-year-old version of me who wished a Super Nintendo only cost five bucks so I could buy one with the money I found under my couch, and equally as important, Sony who was pissed off with Nintendo for going with Philips. Now, even though Sony was still willing to consider working with Nintendo, that didn't necessarily mean everybody who worked for Sony agreed with this. Meet Olaf Olafsson. Now there's some fun wordplay. Try doing that with your name. But back to Olaf. He was president of the Sony Interactive Entertainment Division, but Basically, he was the guy who handled a lot of Sony's business in the United States at the time. Now, influenced by their mutual dislike of Nintendo, he and Tom formed a friendly business relation with each other, one that led to Sony publishing some games that would appear on Sega consoles, like Sewer Shark for Sega CD. Not exactly a showstopper, but it has its fans. So it wasn't long before Tom and Olaf decided they wanted Sony and Sega to make a console. In fact, working with Sony for Sega's next console was Tom's number one choice with a bullet. But okay, that's just Sega of America and a division of Sony who wants to do that. They don't get the final say anyways, so who cares? All the geniuses are at Sega of Japan, are they not? Well. 
That's what I always thought, too. I mean, the lifeblood of video games in the 80s and 90s came from Japan. That's where a large majority of the best games and consoles were being made. Well, while that's all true, it turns out Sega of America deserved a lot more credit. Certainly far more credit than I used to give them. I always figured they were the idiots. I mean, they were the ones who changed the name of Thunder Force 4 to Lightning Force when they localized it, and then they didn't even spell lightning right. How does this happen? Well, as it turns out, Tom and his team in the US, in my opinion, actually deserved a ton of credit for Sega's success. After only having roughly 6-10% to of the gaming market share at the beginning of the 90s, from there, almost every decision he made helped Sega gain precious ground on Nintendo until Sega eventually owned the majority of the gaming market share for a while. Tom was considered kind of a magic man wherever he went. With feats such as repopularizing Hot Wheels and Barbie, how fitting is it that this jackhammer landed on the Genesis? So Tom got Sega a lead, and a lead that probably could have lasted longer had Sega of Japan been successful in coming to terms on a new console with Sony. Because darn near every decision Tom made had worked, I have to imagine partnering with Sony would have worked too. At the very least, it would have prevented their biggest competition from whooping their butts and giving them a world-class noogie. Okay, but why should we trust Tom so much? What exactly did he do for Sega? Well, besides being very aggressive with the pricing and marketing of Sega, he also played a key role in making sure Sonic would turn out to be the great success that it was. Tom fought back against Sega of Japan's original idea for Sonic to have fangs, and a human girlfriend named Madonna. Yikes. Then after Sonic 1, the famed creator of Sonic, Yuji Naka, who grew sick and tired of Sega of Japan, was going to quit. And had it not been for Sega of America allowing him to come to the United States with his own team, he probably would have. And I don't know about you, but I'd say having the creator of Sonic is probably pretty important to Sonic. Yuji Naka was kind of like Sega's equivalent equivalent of Nintendo's Shigeru Miyamoto. You can't let that guy just walk out the door, make him a smoothie, massage his back, buy his mother a wig, do something, just make sure you don't lose him. Oh, and just to throw it in there real quick, Tom was also against the 32X as well as the early surprise release of the Saturn, as opposed to the original later release date, both of which are widely considered bad business decisions now. Thing is, for every good idea Sega of America had that worked, it was always met with resistance by Sega of Japan before it would eventually be approved. Plus, I think it's noteworthy to keep in mind that the Genesis, called the Mega Drive in Japan, wasn't nearly as successful there as it was in the US. So there was always a lingering feeling that they resented Sega of America's loud approach, as successful as it might have been. So it sure does seem highly suspicious that when the folks in Japan at Sega and Sony couldn't work out a deal, perhaps Sega of Japan didn't try as hard to make the deal work as Tom would have liked them to. As far as why the deal didn't go through, each side gave the reasons, such as concerns over how the profits would be shared and just a general desire to go it alone, but it essentially came down to each side feeling like the deal wouldn't benefit them, which is obviously the reason for making any sort of deal, and nobody wants to be taken for a ride. For example, just ask my local grocery store. They sell bananas for 19 cents a nanner by the nanner, no matter the size. So when they put out these mega Mega nanners, guess who decided to stock up at 19 cents a nanner? These things could be used as weapons. Who wants to be attacked by somebody that's got one of these? Nintendo also backed out of their deal with Sony because they felt like Sony would be getting the better of them. 
Well, Sony did end up getting the better of both Sega and Nintendo with the first PlayStation. But hey, you know what they always say, if you can't beat them, lose to them. Now, as attractive as it might be to say that Sega could potentially still be alive in the hardware business today had they been able to partner with Sony, who really knows how it would have worked out? Things might have turned sour eventually, and with two huge companies like that, it seems like it would have only been a matter of time before they did. And perhaps the deal would have never even been made in the first place, even if Sega of Japan had tried harder, because Sony could have eventually just said no regardless. Still, a part of me wishes it would have worked out just to see. It sure does seem likely that Sega would have lasted longer. Don't get me wrong, I love the Saturn and it's one of my favorite consoles, but I don't think it would have hurt Sega creatively to partner with Sony. Remember, the PS1 was extremely developer friendly. I feel like Sega would have been able to do their thing trying to make unique games. I do have one concern though. Would the hardware have been as capable at handling 2D games as the Saturn is? My guess is no, because Sony's main hardware designer, Ken Kutaragi, was all about making a console that was focused on 3D games. And seeing as Sega sourced most of their hardware parts from other companies, whereas Sony made them in-house, it would make sense that Sony would have taken the lead on the hardware of the console. So games like X-Men vs. Street Fighter with the RAM expansion cart in all their glory probably wouldn't have existed, certainly not in the same way. Well, not something to worry about, I guess, because it never happened. And sure, there's a lot of potential deals that fall through in the big business world, but this one feels a little bitter to me for a couple of reasons. Reason number one, almost nobody seems to know and or care about it. Reason number two, the man responsible for turning Sega around, Mr. Tom Kalinske, didn't get to see his vision all the way through after being so dang effective up to that point. But hey, that's how things go. These were some of the more formative years of the gaming industry, and there's a lot of decisions that could have been made to drastically alter the course of things. All right, but throughout this video, you may have been wondering what the deal is with this controller. Some sort of rare prototype? Nope, it's just a PS2 controller. That also works for PS1, that Sega released once they were no longer in the hardware race. To which some of you might be thinking, well, that's a dirty trick. Yes, it is is and I'd gladly do it again. I'm trying to teach people history here. You need a little bit of firepower to keep people interested. But with all that said, I'm curious what your thoughts are, and specifically if as a fan you would have liked to see a Sega Sony console. Remember, this is putting the business implications aside. Simply as a fan, would you have wanted to see it? Because for me, the business implications are the only reason I would have liked to see it. As a fan, I much prefer having each separate console. So with that, leave your comments down below and I will see ya in the next video. He's the Red Cooper, yeah. And he's talking, talking about video games. He's 